Anyone knows what is this if I write? If I write integer pointer a, what does it mean? It means a pointer to a or many integers, right? It could be an array of ints, correct? Are we okay with this? All right. What if I write something like this? Let's call it B. <clears throat> what is that? It's address, it's address of this guy. So I can actually write address of A. You follow? Or, or it could be an array of integer pointers. Are we okay with this? <clears throat> okay, that's easy. Let's call this int ptr. Is that okay? If I wrote int ptr pointer b is equal to address of a, would anybody get confused? Int ptr a, int ptr pointer b, b is address of a, right? So it's a recursive thing. Like if somebody writes over there int pointer, don't get scared. It's just not, it's it's a pointer to a pointer to a pointer. <laughs> okay? So it, it's just a single variable that is pointing to a three-dimensional array. All right? But we don't care about that. This is what I'm interested in. So it's this is a pointer to an array of pointers of integer. So if I wanted to have, let's put it this way. <clears throat> Just to make it simple and uh, so we understand what's going on. If I have integer pointer B10, what does it mean? B, I have 10 integer pointers. Are we okay with this? 10 integer pointers. What if I want to make that dynamic? That's a statically allocated array, right? So essentially what this means is that this is B pointing to series of arrays and each one of them are going to point to somewhere, correct? That's what it's going to be. But this is 10 exactly. If I want to make it dynamic, I have to create a pointer instead, correct? which means it becomes, so if essentially integer pointer pointer x could hold actually b now. So x is actually, can actually hold, so x can point to something like this now. Are we okay with this? All right, you'll see what I, why I did this, why I'm actually talking about this. So try, so, <clears throat> Let's even make it simpler, okay? Let's write another code. Should I write this over there on the, on the thing? Let me write it on a screen. Uh, let me write it on a, uh, on uh, the, on Visual Studio. So, yeah, so this was the reason that I, that I actually put that one on because I wrote an example and I want, let me just bring the other one up because I wanted to, I want you to not to get confused what the heck is this. So that's why I, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it in two seconds. Let me just close everything over here. So if I have something like this, let's say, uh, I'm going to say void move one forward. 
And what do I mean by this? Let's say I have <coughs> uh, a character str, I don't know, 10 is set to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Okay, so I have that one. And I have character pointer p that is same thing as str, right? Now, if I do see out target of p, what's going to get printed? What's going to get printed now? One. One is going to get printed, right? One, the digit one. Are we okay? Seriously? You're actually thinking about it. Okay. Um, <clears throat> SDR is pointing to the beginning of this. P is pointing to this. So it's like a snake with two heads. SDR and P are pointing at the beginning. So it's the same thing as this one. If I do P0, what's going to get printed? Okay, so if I said P0, everybody knows it's 1. There is no, whoa. Okay. Uh, I didn't test uh, the thing I wrote, so that's why I get 55,000 errors. I wouldn't have compiled it today. So exclude from project. Exclude from project. I'll bring it back up and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it. So, so if I run this one more time without all those things in there, one is going to get printed. Are we okay with this? Okay. Now, and I have, a, for some reason, double space over here. So if I, so again, now, instead of P0, I'm saying target of P. It's pointer arithmetic, IPC and OOP, right? So now if I do, now if I run this, it's the same thing, one, right? Now if I do P++, and I print the exact same thing, what's going to get printed? Two. So I'm going to have one and two. There is no question about this, right? Now, what can I do so I can write over here, move one forward, and I'll pass P or something into it. So it moves P1 forward, so it's going to print 3 over here. What can I do? If I want to, because this is a variable, right? P is a variable. I want to add 1 to it. So I have to pass the address of P to be able to modify it, correct? If I'm passing the address of p, what is type of p? It's integer pointer. And address of it will come, right? PPTR, let's call it. And now in here, if I say target of PPTR plus plus, I am actually adding to the target of PPTR, which is p. So now, why is it giving me an error? Oh, because it's int, not int, care. Care, sorry. Yeah. All right. So now if I run it, I'm going to have one, two, three. Are we okay with this? Are we okay? <laughs> Are we okay? Are we okay? Everybody? Yes. Why? Okay. Uh, type def uh, int ptr to, sorry, char ptr character pointer. Is that correct? We can do that? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Are we okay with this? Now, if I write over here char ptr. Q is set to SDR, and I want to pass char PTR to that thing, what do I write over here? If I want to actually write it, char PTR is a, is a pointer, right? If I want to have move forward, I have to say char PTR, PTR, and in here I would say exactly the same thing, no difference. Correct? Now I can actually say over here, move forward, move one forward, and put address of Q. 
Everybody's okay with line 14? Now that's IPC144 for heaven's sake. That's IPC144. I want to change. I want to change the value of this variable that is PTR. Why everybody's looking confused? Oh my goodness. Okay, let me just do something else. Okay. I thought I'm going to write it and everybody says, got to say, oh, now I understand. But that was a big mistake. Uh, okay, back to kindergarten. So add void add one. Okay, integer pointer i or p, right? Correct? Now, in here, if I want to add to the value of the target of that, I have to say target of p plus plus, correct? Now, I'm going to say over here, integer a is set to 10. Now, I'm going to say add 1, address of a, and it, a becomes 11. Anybody have problem with that? No problem? Now, I'm going to change this type. To character pointer, character pointer, character pointer. What's the difference? Character pointer is a type. I'm extracting its address. Did anything change? It's the same, right? We're OK now, hopefully. Well, why are you thinking about that? I have, I have a variable called A. I want to get its address. If you want to get the address of a type, what do you add to it? Asterisk to get the type, right? If it's employee, it becomes employee asterisk P to hold the address of an employee, correct? Now my type is character star. So I have to say character star pointer. So I have to add the pointer sign to character star. Therefore, it becomes character star asterisk P. So character star is a type. That's why I, I always stick the pointer, the, this thing, to the type, not the variable, because that's part of the type. OK? Always think of it that way, and then th there's no confusion. Don't think of it like it's an address of an address. Who cares? It's a variable. I want to change it using its address. Right? Yes. Yeah, it's address 10, and now it becomes 11. So if I actually do this, if I cast this to character pointer, then it's address 10 of memory. It's address 10 of memory. It means I'm pointing to the 10 bytes in my RAM, 10th byte in my RAM. Or I can point to a string if I want to. If I can say character, character name, A, B, C. Now in here, I can, instead of this character pointer as a constant, I can put name over here. Now A points to the address of A. But not now, uh, now you're confused. <laughs> okay, so how many people were confused and okay now? <laughs> okay, let me see which, how can I put it? To what? OK, any type that you are dealing with to create a pointer to a type, you add an asterisk to it, right? That type can be anything, even a pointer. Yes, sir. I did. I started with drawing the memory, then I coded it. So I actually did draw a memory. You want me to do it again? OK, <laughs> I'll do it again. So what I'm saying is that OK, so this is ABC, and I call it name, correct? And the address over here is 400. This is the 400th byte in memory. 
Are we okay with this? Oh, should I rec oh, record? Okay. There we go. Okay. Yeah, so this is the array name, and there is ABC. So essentially, this means I, I have character, name, A. Sorry for writing the last time I wrote was 15 years ago. Okay, so, so that's character name ABC, right? Now, maybe if I use color, <laughs> that helps. So now, I'm going to put two bytes for a pointer, but pointer is actually four bytes, okay? So, so now, I'm going to call this character pointer P, and it has 400 in it. Therefore, it's pointing to here. Are we okay with this? And I can say character pointer P is equal to name, correct? Are we okay with this? Now, this one is character pointer pointer Q that holds the address of P, which means if this is 300, there are going to be 300 here, which means this points to that one. If I say, if I say P plus plus, I will have 400, 401, and therefore, it's going to point to here. Correct? If I say, and this is 300, not 30. If I say Q plus plus, what's going to happen? It's going to add two bytes in this case. It's supposed to be four, but let's assume the pointers are two bytes. This becomes three. O2, which means it's going to point to some place in segmentation fault because there is nothing here that belongs to us. Correct? But if I say, so I'm not going to say that. I'm not going to do that. But if I say target of Q plus plus, target of Q, 400. It was 401 actually. Plus plus becomes 402, and it's going to point to here. Are we okay now? Hopefully. All right? OK. Anyways. All right. So now that we have that one, let's start our uh, discussion for today. So <clears throat> it's one of those lectures that are my favorite because I have to talk a lot instead of uh, oh, and. Uh, yeah, so relationship between objects, you can have it in three different ways, okay? Uh, a composition, we say, is a, has a relationship between classes and implements complete ownership, which means na the, when, when I have over here uh, something called name that I create of, of type A, name, and then I create a person that has name, where the person name goes and the person name, name, name comes back. If I create a, or it could be a pointer. If I create a person, a name gets created. When the uh, uh, person is gone, name is gone. Everybody's okay with that? You okay with that? So there's no, there is no, I mean, it's complete dependent, the dependency between one and another one. Uh, a name without a person cannot exist in this design. A person has a name, it's like an array of it and its element. You cannot have an element without an array. You have to have an, an array to have elements inside, right? That's composition. And well, we know what it is, right? Aggregation is... Um, essentially working in a way that the objects, it, aggregation is when an object manages and puts order in already existing objects, or objects whose 
uh, lifetime and, and it's uh, uh, coming to life and going out of the scope and stuff is not related to that, which means if I remove it, the object is managed, it manages, it still exists and it doesn't go away. Uh, the example that is putting over here, and it says we have a club and we have people. A club, throw it away, people they still exist. But when people become member of a club, a club can manage those people. This is the, I don't know, uh, I don't know, treasury of the club. These are members of the club. So a club can manage people. But if you remove a club, people still exist. This type of thing is essentially called an aggregation. It's another type of design. An association is relationship between the two objects. Again, objects exist completely independently, but they can keep track of each other, okay? Uh, which is the example I think over here puts course and a, and a room. A room can have this, the design, the reason that I wrote that code because I didn't like this is association does a one by one thing, which means one course can be only in one room. So you get the room and you say there's one course in it. So it's a one-to-one -one relationship. Not always associations are one-to-one -one relationship. It's sometimes many-to-many. -many. It builds a graph, which brings me to the next ex the, the example that I wrote. I didn't compile it. I just wrote it. Of course, it's going to have five million errors. I'm going to uh, fix it and make it compilable so it runs and you can walk through it, and then we're going to go through it. So this is the example that I have written for this. So it kind of I, it makes more sense. It makes it more clear. So. Let me bring the things into picture and then remove this silly program of mine. Usually, associ associa uh, 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 the, the, the association between objects uh, are done through pointers and references, too. But the thing with references is that then the object cannot, like when the, you can have a library that is empty, there is no book in it. Okay, this is zero and many relation, okay? But if I have a car that can have five different engines, one of five, I can have a bigger engine, smaller engine, different types of engine, okay? The association between a car and its engine, it's that the car can not exist without any engine, but it could have one of many. That's another type of thing. It does have it. When the car goes away, the engine goes away. I don't know. It's, yeah, let me bring up my example. I'll explain it to you. Uh, it's very difficult to bring it because you, you have to actually build a real system to be able to talk about this. So that's why I did this. Let me just, let me just bring it up. Most, most definitely. Thank you very much for reminding me. Yeah, again, when I teach, I lose my mind, so please remind me of the crazy stuff that I'm doing, so not to do it. What am I doing now? I want to add stuff to the project. So add existing items. So this is, has like a little bit of everything in it. It's not only the association stuff, so we're going to start. First of all, I have an interface over here. Yes. Oh, really? You can't understand with that? OK. <laughs> you cannot read between the lines. OK. Sorry about that. All right. Yeah. So because I wanted to display this stuff, all the things that I'm writing, they, they, I want them to be displayable. And it, usually, when you are writing an, uh, uh, an interface, interface has an able at the end, like I-O able, it means it's being or printable, readable. So these objects are readable. Um, it doesn't do anything. It's a pure thing. Um, it, it's just a, an interface that uh, essentially overloads the uh, read and write, so I don't have to do it for every single thing that I'm writing. I was just lazy. I did that, so it overloads all of them, OK? Now, let's think about a title. So a title is essentially a string, that uh, a dynamic string that is printable, so I don't have to overload the thing. Uh, it's exactly like the same thing that we had over there. So it has a value, 
null. It can allocate value for it. So it has a constructor. It has a copy constructor. It has an assignment operator. You can check one title to see if it's equal to the other one. It can display itself and make sure that there's no memory leak. So I don't need to go through the code of this thing. This is OP244 week three. So let's not do this. Now, let's talk about a book. Now, a book has a title. We all know that. A book has an ISBN. So essentially, the relationship between a book and a title is what? What do we call? Yeah. So what happens is that essentially, this is the very first thing, composition. This is the first thing that we actually mentioned. So when you remove a book, the title is gone. It's dependent to it. So that's the first thing, very simple and straightforward, right? But a book can exist in many different libraries. Title of a book, it could be in many different libraries. So when you're actually looking at a book, you need to be able to see which libraries it exists in. I don't care what a library class is. I just have, because I don't know how many, if, if I knew how many, if I would say, OK, I have 200 libraries, and that's it, and not more, I would actually do this, 200. But we are in OP345. I don't know how many libraries I have. I want to be able to add to the number of libraries as I go. So essentially, my book can appear in many libraries. And any library that it's going to appear in, I'm going to add the address to it. So this library thing of mine is a growing uh, uh, array of addresses. And if you look at the code, it actually, it's very simple and straightforward. So if you look at the book, you will see that um, I, to make it easy, I made the book not copyable. It has a copyright. <laughs> you cannot copy a book. You cannot send it to anything else, so it's deleted. I removed that the copy constructor and stuff just to make it simple. Two books are the same if their ISBN is the same. That's a no-brainer. We know that. It can display itself. It can read itself. And you can add a book to a library. So if I pass a reference of a library, it's going to first try to find the library. If the library doesn't exist, if I don't have it, if the library is not in the list, it will actually allocate another array with one more number of one more library over here, resize it, make it one bigger, copy everything from the old to new one, add the address of that library to the list, delete the old one, update the list, add one to the number of libraries, and we are gone. Simple, straightforward dynamic memory allocation. Again, don't let this thingy confuse you because it's an array of Library pointers, I have to make it a pointer to a pointer. I have no other choice. OK? And I can remove a book from a library. If this library doesn't want to carry this book anymore, I can remove it. So essentially, uh, I check to see if the library is there or not. If the library is there, so that find returns the index. If the index, index is 0 or greater, it means it is in the list. Now I allocate. Uh, an array one smaller than the other one. I start copying everything other than the one that is indexed. So everything gets copied other than the one that I want to remove. Then I delete the old one, update the list, reduce the number of libraries by one, and I'm done. So it's as simple and straightforward. And I made the logic for the two examples. So as you see, now if you have a book, you see, I don't know, uh, Fox in Socks, and you see it's it can list all the libraries that, it, that this book can be found at. That's one direction. If I remove a book and throw it away, if a book gets destroyed, go out, goes out of memory, do the libraries go away? No. These are just addresses of already existing libraries out there. It has nothing to do with it. The libraries will be after the book is there and will, was there before the book comes to life. So, it, they have no relation between each other. Now, if I look at the library, it is the exact same way, like book, but the other way. So it has a title. It has a pointer of books, how many books the library has. It has so many books in it. 
and it has a number of books to know how many it is and the find and yada, yada, yada. It's the exact same thing. Literally, the code is exactly the same thing. If I go to the library code, you will see that it has a find that finds it. It has an ad that literally looks for the book. Exactly same thing. And you, if you see, but the, the, the two libraries are the same if the title of the libraries are the same. I don't know. Uh, Vaughn Public Library. If they, if they both say Vaughn Public Library, then it's the same library. So I'm checking with the title. And the exact same thing for the remove. And the display is displaying it its own way, and so on and so forth. So again, when the, sorry, this is wrong. Why it says M books? When the library goes away. Yeah, it, when the library goes away, Good thing, actually. Where is it? The array of pointers are being deleted, not the books that they are pointing to. So only the array of pointers are going to go away, not the books that they are pointing to. Therefore, so essentially, the relationship between these two are something like this. Essentially, it's so I have libraries. And I have books. And one book could be in several libraries. And one library can have many books. So again, the relationship goes like that. So if you list the books, it's going to say this one and this one. If you list the books over here, it's going to say only this one. If you list it over here, it's going to say that one and that one. On the other hand, you come over here, you see which library this book exists in, and just say this one, not the other one. So you follow what I'm saying. This is what they wanted to tell you. So that's essentially the whole chapter of that thing uh, and the relationship between the objects. And these are the things that... Uh, um, you need to understand when, when you're dealing with collections, OK? And the addresses of the collections, OK? Bringing back up the, the thing and wiping up the, all right. Any questions down to here? Why well, you have funny smiles on your face, as if like, how can I ask a question? I didn't understand anything. Uh, is, did, did I make sense? Forget about the code, but you understood what does it mean? Implementation, forget about it. You've got to go. Remember, F10 and F11 are your friends, okay? <laughs> so uh, when I write the code, I'm going to write the main for it, and I'm going to create like four titles and two li libraries, and I'm going to add them one by one so you can see exactly what happens when you actually list the books and you see which libraries the books are in and so on and so forth. All right. Any questions down to here? You always ask good questions, but in a very, right. very, very quiet way, which I actually have to. Uh, the relationship between the library objects and the book objects there, you would consider that association or? It uh, is. Association. Yeah, it is. So they are association. They, they, they are associated with each other. You can, from one book, you can find out which libraries you can find the book in. But again, if you throw all the books away, the libraries stay. They have nothing. Existence of the libraries have no relationship with the. The, the tough part is though, like, isn't that almost like still essentially the same thing as uh, aggregator? Yeah, but, but the, the thing with, uh, what is the difference? Okay, what is it? The difference between this and aggregation is that. Over there, the objects are managed by one. They don't have two-way relationship. They are not aware of each other. In association, they are aware of each other. A, a person is not, the, in that design, a person is not aware of which club he or she is in. But the club knows who are it, their, their members are. That's the difference. But again, those objects exist on their own. OK?
So if I, would, if I wanted to write that code, let me just go to the CPP file and, and I just show it to you what do I mean by that. So let me get, so this is the person class, right? I'm not going to write the, uh, the code behind it, okay? So this is the person class, okay? And I'm going to remove this public over here. Oh, no, uh, this is the person class. It stays as is, okay? And I'm going to have the name class. OK, down to here. Now I'm going to remove this public from here. OK. Then I'm going to write a forward declaration over here, say, uh, class person. And in here, I'm going to write friend class person. Now what you have is an aggregation. You cannot change this. Now you cannot instantiate that name by itself. Impossible. Are we okay? All right. Okay. Are we okay? Well, now the one person is happy. Five other people are looking at it. What the hell you're talking about? So are you okay with this? Are we okay? Are we okay? No, because everything is private. You cannot instantiate name anywhere. The only place that you can actually instantiate the name is inside person's constructor. So inside, because person is a friend of, a, of, of the name, it can actually instantiate name and manage it and do whatever it wants to do with it and delete it or whatever it's, that, that it's needed. But, and no one else can. So you cannot instantiate name anywhere anymore. Are we okay? Are we okay? <laughs> so expression, essentially we're going to go through it and understand how operators work, expressions work in C++. Um, anybody want to, uh, want me to review uh, operator signature detection? Like, like when you see a, a, an operator, how can you detect uh, what is being called? And how you can how can you overload an existing thing? Do you want anything any review on this? Anybody? Um, anyone? All right. So touch the login. All right. So. There are, uh, this is what, what, what we're going to say right now. So we're going to say there are three, there are three uh, major types of operator overloading when you're dealing with, like, looking at operators. We have unary, we have binary, and we have trinary. Trinary operators, forget about it. That's the question mark operator. It's all operators. It's operator. Okay, that's it. Okay? So... Um, when you're dealing with unary operators, you're, you have, so essentially what you have will be, will be something like this. So you have an operator, and then you have an operand, okay? That's one type of an operator, operator and an operand. You have only two types, two postfix operators that you need to deal with. So I could have written like this, but it's essentially A++ and A++. minus minus. These are the two. Okay, so we don't have to worry about anything on those. When you are dealing with uh, uh, unary operators, uh, whenever you see a unary operator, you have to see what is the type that you have over here. And the type that you have over here actually dictates what the unary operator is dealing with if it's a member operator. If it's a member operator, so if I have over here foo A, then what you have for this, either you want to implement it or you want to recognize what it's being called. What you need to have over here would be, yeah, will essentially be foo operator 
whatever the operator is, and then you go like that. Okay? What it returns, as C++ cannot recognize, we cannot recognize too. We have to take a look at the code, or if we are designing, we need to see what do we need to return. So the return type is unknown, and also, depending on how it works, it may be const or not. We don't know. So that's the signature of, an, uh, of a unary operator. If the unary operator you are writing is, is postfix, the only difference is that because there is no signature for it, they fake the signature. Essentially, it will be foo operator, unary operator, which is either plus plus or minus minus, and int. Okay? So when you put an int over there, essentially you are saying this is the postfix one, not the prefix one. Okay? Some compilers, if you don't write, what? It picks that one, picks the one that exists. If it does, so if, if you don't write the int over here and you don't have the prefix operator and you have only postfix, it still calls this one or that one. Some old compilers do that, but uh, new compilers after uh, uh, the uh, 11 and 17, that's not a case anymore. So, that's when you are doing it as a member operator. When you are doing it as a non-member operator, then essentially unary operators accept uh, 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 a non-member operator accepted through the argument list, and they are not member of anything. So whatever foo it is is being passed over here. So if I want to, if I want to have a non-member helper operator to deal with a, then that's where I'm going to put it. So essentially. And definitely there is no const because they are not member of anything. And if I want to actually make that uh, a unary operator, it's going to be foo a like that. And whatever it returns, we don't know. That's a non-member. I don't want to even talk about non-member non operators because you are doing object-oriented programming. If you are writing a non-member operator, think about your choices and try to fix it. Okay, don't, don't do a non-member operator if, if, unless you really have to. The re only reason I believe that you need to have a non-member operator is that when you have a binary operator and you don't have access to the source code of the, of the class at left-hand side. We're going to come to it soon, and I'll explain why. So that's that one. Any problem with this? Another thing that I see happening even in the latest uh, times of, uh, of this question comes up in, in uh, OOP 345, that is, uh, people forget that this is an operator overload. What is the meaning of overload? An overload essentially means you have something, you alternate its action, you alternate its meaning. You have the exact same uh, signature, with, uh, you have the exact same name of the operator with different operands, right? Which means any, it means it should exist and you change it. You cannot create your own new operator. It's impossible. C++ is not capable of doing that. If you have an operator, you can change the meaning for it if it doesn't already apply. You cannot even make plus operator work differently for an integer <laughs> because it's already there and the signature is what it has. You cannot change it. It's impossible. Okay? It, so first, you must have the operator. Secondly, that operator should not be defined for that object that it's supposed to deal with. Then the operator overload comes to the thing. Okay? This is kind of different with what lecture that we're going to have today, but, but I think it's a good thing to know because um, essentially you are going to be overloading these operators. Okay? that we're going to talk about today, the expressions that we are going to talk about today. Uh, when you have a binary operator, you have essentially two operands, right? So you have A and you have B. So two operands, left and right. This can be implemented as member or non-member, or helper function as we call it. If it's a member, depending on what the type is, so I have foo A and I have fa b, if that's the case, then that operator becomes a member of class 
that created A, which is foo. So I'm going to have foo operator that accepts a dot. Again, whatever. OK? What it returns, no one knows. We have to see what is good. So don't think that you have, if, if I have int, if I have, say, employee over here, E, and you have E is equal to that, it's going to return an employee. Not at all. What you see at left side is an L value over here. Whatever you see as a left hand, uh, uh, left operand, does not dictate what the operator is. Remember, the return value is not part of the signature in C++. So it's very possible some kind of a casting or uh, temporary object be getting created. So what is being returning has nothing to do with the design. So you don't know what it returns. When you see E is equal something like that, and E is an employee, you have the expectation to see an employee being returned, either reference or value. But you cannot be sure. Remember that. Don't look for it. First, find the operator, see what it returns. OK? And in here, you either have a reference, or you have a constant, or you have move if you want to, whatever you want to create. OK? So uh, it could be cost, it could be reference, and it could be const over here, too. So depending on what type of a thing it's dealing with, that becomes a, a binary operator. So binary operators as members always are a member of the left-hand operator class, left-hand operand class. And they receive the right one as an argument. Are we OK with this? All right. Binary operators as helpers, which are not member variables, Binary operators as members, which are not member, uh, which are not member, they are helpers. Helpers that we create. Um, again, you should avoid it at all costs. Um, especially, I see one of you creating a friend somewhere, then we'll be in trouble. Remember what the friends are. What friends are for in object orientation? What friends are for? Knife in the back. Object orientation. Friends are friends are only for ownership. Remember that. Friends are not friendship. They are ownership in object orientation. Remember that. When you have an object friend of another object, it means it has total control on the other one. Friendship is actually ownership. OK? Now, what is the signature of this one? So essentially, it's going to be operator. And at left operand, whatever it is, so if this is foo and this is fa, at left hand, you're going to have foo, f1, or let's call it left operand, and you're going to have fa right operand. What it returns remains a mystery. You have to take a look at it. We don't know. They, they could be const. They could be reference, const, and reference. We don't know. OK? Now, what are these things used for usually, member operators? When you don't have access to the implementation of the left operand. You have done that many times with C in and C out. When you want an object to work with C out, what do you do? You write a helper operator because you don't have access. If you could go and change the source code for OStream, then you could actually put the class far inside OStream and have a member binary operator. But the problem is that we don't have access to that because we don't have access to the source code of the class. We create a, a, a binary helper. And one of the worst things you can do is to make this a friend of a class. Whatever access you need to have to the right-hand operator, make it an accessor in the class. Uh, have some control over it. Don't give wide access to your class used to any uh, non-member functions, because that is going to create consequences beyond your expectation. OK, it's going to create bugs that you are not aware of. You, the whole point of having methods inside the class is to be able to put constraints on accessing the class and make the class behave properly in different scenarios. Having a, um, a function as a non-member function opens a back door to your class that they can do things 
When I say they, you know who's they. It's you. You are going to do something to your class that later on you won't be able to detect. And you have no idea, what this thing, why this thing got null? I have no idea. And, and, and it's because something got, was a friend and you just changed something that you, that you shouldn't have. So careful. Uh, you can overload the index operator. An overloading in index operator uh, is essentially, uh, so whenever you have foo A and you have AI, you have something like this, either as, le as left value or at light R value. As left value, if, if it's F, as L value, if you want it to be. So this can be two things, either R, val R, val or R value or L value. What is an L value? L value is something that you can put at left-hand side of an assignment operator. You can set it to stuff. R value is something that you cannot put at, because, because the thing is at, uh, uh, it's temporary or literal values, so you, you cannot do it, okay? Um, so to design it that way, if you want this thing to be uh, an R val, then what you do, the, it's going to be a member of foo, so essentially it's going to be foo operator index, and in here goes an integer. It's not unsigned. Indexes don't, don't have to be unsigned, unsigned. You can have index minus 5. It doesn't make any difference. Index, and even for literal values, that's the case. Like if you have integer, if, if I have integer a5, and I have integer pointer p that points to address of a2, then I can t write p minus 1, and that becomes a1. Do I? Because translation of this one is essentially the target of p plus minus 1, right? Therefore, it, it's, it's simply a, a value that going to be either added or, uh, or, uh, or uh, reduces the the, the address that it's dealing with. So because of this thing, that doesn't have to be a negative, uh, a positive value. So that's going to be your index. Okay. Int index for now. You can have this as other things that integer too, but we're not going there. Okay. So if you return a reference over here, it's an LVAL. If you don't return a reference, it's uh, an ARVA, and this returns this, ideally, if that's what it's supposed to. Oh, sorry, it returns, uh, it returns whatever index you want to deal with. So, so let me, sorry, my, let me try and be. So if you have something like this, int index, you do some calculation on a collection over here, and whatever that collection is, that uh, index is returned. Now, this return statement that you have, whatever this type is, type of data is, that's what it's going to return. If you don't have this one, then you can only do this. So that's an RVAL. So if you don't have, so if you have over here type, just like this with nothing, that's the only thing you can do. For this to go at left side, to be able to do something like that, that has to be a reference. Otherwise, it's not going to work out. All right? And what you are going to return, it's not, it cannot be a temporary thing. You cannot return temporary values. Like I've seen many people do indexes, and when the index goes off limit, they return some temporary value out. You can't do that with a reference. You cannot create a local variable called garbage in here and return the garbage with a reference if you want because the garbage dies within the scope of the operator. That's a bad thing to do. You have to be extremely careful. Okay. You can make an, uh, uh, an object act differently based on the cast that they are going through. And this is the last thing I'm going to talk about, which essentially means if you say foo a, and then you say type 
A is equal to type A. To make this work, you can overload it. You can actually overload casting, which essentially means when you are overloading, it's going to be foo. There is no return type because it's a casting of that type. Essentially, the cast that you are doing is the type. So it's foo operator. You put the type in here, whatever type is. Um, and, and then you turn. So type, and then we return. So operator, character, pointer, whatever you want to have. And then uh, you return. So you have a type over here, whatever type that you are returning, type, whatever. So what you are returning has to be that type. So essentially, if your object is casted to the type, it's, this procedure is going to get executed. And hopefully, within the execution, you're going to process a type and return it out. OK? You can return a reference. No, you, don't, you cannot return a reference. These are uh, 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 casts. So they're all R value. Are we OK? So that's the review that we had on, on all operator overloads that you had, and there's nothing else over there. Um, All right. This essentially means that unary, opera unary operator, binary, and trinary operator, um, uh, postfix, prefix, unary, binary, trinary, um, order of evaluation. It starts from the, like if you look at the bottom, this is the strongest thing that you have, then throw. It's written over here what throw is. I'm not going to talk about it because it's error handling. Throw. Um, uh, how many people actually wrote Java programs here or C Sharp? OK, how many people know what exceptions are? And when you really know what they are, not just you heard about it. You know how to handle exceptions? OK. OK, exceptions. OK, exceptions are this. Let me tell you what the exceptions are. Um, I'm just going to quickly mention, and then when the time comes, I'm going to actually teach it so you'll see what it is. Imagine that. I am, there's, we, have, we are playing a game and I'm throwing a ball over here down towards you guys at, at, at the end of the class. And I specify every single row which one to pick up. So I'm going to say the first row is going to get the volleyball, the second row is going to get the basketball, the third one is going to get a ball, a ball, and the last one is going to get any, any sphere shaped thing. <laughs> okay? So now if I throw a volleyball, the first row is going to catch it. If I throw a basketball, the first row is going to see it's a basketball, not mine passes through, the second one is going to get. If I throw a soccer ball, the first one is going to see volleyball. No. The second one is going to see basketball. No. The third one says any type of ball I'm going to grab. They get it. OK? And if I throw globe of <laughs> uh, anything, like if I throw any, any globe like type of sphere type of thing, that's the last one. And that's usually what exceptions are. So what you do, instead of handling errors by returning true false values, what they do, they throw exceptions. Which means in your code, you throw different objects. You can throw any type of object, throw an integer, throw an employee, throw a car. You can throw any type of object. As long as your code eventually sits inside the catch that catches, so essentially you try, inside a try statement that has a catch at the end that receives that type of object. So if you're throwing cars, you're going to have a catch for cars, which is stupid. That's not exception handling. Usually when you're doing exception handling, you have a class of type exception and different type of exception. So you have a general exception that is for everything. Then you have file not ready exception. I don't know, divide by zero exception, null pointer assignment exception, different types of exception that are all children of exception. And you lay them in the order that you want the error messages to be caught. And you put your functions that throw exceptions inside the try statement. Therefore, you don't have to worry about what returns what and how error is happening. At any moment, any error happens, the program stops, and the execution of the program will be transferred to your catch statement where you are catching the proper error that you're supposed to deal with it. Therefore, your business logic is not going to get mixed with your error handling logic. 
If you look at what we have done down to this point, when we are getting an integer, we are saying, oh, every single time user is entering something, I write the whole loop for every single thing that the user is doing to see if it's wrong. I say, no, go back again, no, go back again. It, so all my, I want to get a mark, right, for a, for a course. But when you look at my logic, it has nothing to do with the mark of a course. First, it's dealing with valid integer. Then it's going to deal if it's between this and that. That's going to throw you off. Instead of doing that, you simply get a mark. If you see it is not within the boundary, you throw out of range exception. If you see it's not a valid integer, you throw in valid integer exception. And you don't handle it at all. You let the error handling part of your logic to deal with it. Therefore, the business logic and error handling get separated from each other. And that's exception handling. And many places are completely against it. Many companies don't like it at all. They write the good old-fashioned returning true false if something goes wrong, and they think that's a better way to go. Well, we need to learn it, so we're going to go through it. So that's the throw that you see over there, and we have an ex explanation down there. I don't want to go through it. Binary operators. Binary operators are essentially you dealing with the guts of the system, which means uh, instead of uh, With binary operators, the operation that you see, the operations that you see written over there, uh, uh, with bitwise operators, the bitwise operators, the operation that you see over there, happens on corresponding bits inside your, your variable, not the variable as a whole. So if you have two variables, one is A and one is B, so the bit pattern for, so that's, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So if, say, the bit pattern of A is this one, and you end it with bit pattern of, of let's say, X that is this one, then it's going to say 1 and 1, 1. 0 and 1, 0. 1 and 0, 0. It does it like that and gives you a result. And that's bitwise operator. Um, those are for extremely low-level programming part of the thing that we are not going to deal with. And the insertion operator that you see is actually an overload uh, of left shift and right shift operator. That we call it insertion operator. There is no such thing. It's just an overload. Okay? It used to be written only for left shift and right shift. Conditional operator, logical and and or. Then it goes to bitwise and and or. So these are all the uh, uh, sequence of the things that are uh, uh, called like that. Um, Please go through it and take a look at it. I don't want to read it one by one. Typecasting, you know what it is. No exception is an operator to check, check to see if something actually throws an exception or not. So you can see if you want to actually put it in a catch statement or not. We're going to deal with it later. A line of, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, a line of and size of. These two are usually mistaken with each other. Okay? A line of and size of. To see what the difference is, I'm going to give you a very quick example and be done with it. I don't want to go through it too much. But it is something that is really good to know. <clears throat> Struct int a float b Character C. What is size of this? Anybody knows? And um, lots of people think size of actually gives you, gives you length of a string. It has nothing to do with that. OK? So if I say, so I can do over here struct S, and I can go size of S. This is an operator. It's not a function call. It looks like a function call, but it's an operator. So if I say size of s, it is going to return the size of the structure. What is integer? Four bytes. What is float? Eight. What is character? One. So it, we think that it's nine bytes, but it's actually 
uh, count as four bytes. So this is essentially 12 bytes in size. If I run it, you'll see. Why? It's because of the alignment. And what the heck is alignment? It's the next thing that I'm going to tell you. So if you see size of S, it's going to tell you 12 bytes, which means if you create a pointer of S and you do plus plus, it jumps 12 bytes further. When you are dealing with memory, when things are put in memory, they have to sit in coefficient of their size, primitive values. Primitive values, uh, they have primitive types. They have to sit in a coefficient of their size. They cannot uh, sit in any address. So if I have an integer, the size of integer is 4, which means the addresses that an integer can sit at should be 0, 4, 8, 12, 16. These are the addresses that, a, that a, uh, an integer can sit in. You cannot put an integer in address 3 or 2. It doesn't work that way. Why? Because that's the hard, how the hardware is designed. Okay? Now, if that's why if I, if I write a structure like this, so if I actually write a structure like this, struct S, I should have written the, like this. So if I write a struct int A and then write over here uh, double D. If I do something like this, then the size of this one will be 8. Sorry, uh, 16. Because double is 8, integer is 4, the first one sits on address of 4, the double has to sit on address of 8. Because of that fact, it has to skip 4 bytes so the other one sits at the proper address. So you're going to have 4 bytes wasted memory over there. But what is the difference between align and size of? If this struct, I'm going to call this struct foo, and I'm going to say over here foo s. So size of s, we said it's 12, right? But if you do go do align of foo, so if you essentially write over here align of foo, there is the, the, the output's going to be 4. It means if foo sits, any object of foo sits anywhere in the memory that the address is 4, everything will be sitting in a valid address. You follow what I'm saying? If I, this is 4, this is 4, this is 1, correct? If I put this foo anywhere in the memory, if the address that it begins is a coefficient of 4, then float will be sitting on a coefficient of 4, which is valid. Character is going to be sitting on a coefficient of 1, which is valid, which is OK. Which means this structure's alignment is 4. This structure can sit in any address that is coefficient of 4. It's not the maximum, no. It's much more complicated than that. Write few structures and see the alignment. Try to figure it out. That's why we have the, the alignment. It's much more difficult than that. It depends on the size of the fetch, uh, the fetch width of your CPU. It, it depends on the, on the size of the, like, do you have a 16-bit operator? What type of me memory alignment you have? It's a very, very tough thing to work with. Work with. So I cannot comment you on that because it's got to be very difficult. OK? Um, but again, size of? tells you what is the total size. Like if you allocate memory, how much memory you need to put it. A line of tells you what is the coefficient of the address of the memory in which that thing can sit, and all the primitive values sit in a proper address. OK? Try it. Put five, six things back to back, and you're going to go bananas. OK, then it's gonna, you're going to see what the alignment is. And it's pretty simple. Just write a code and print it out, and you'll see what it is. OK. I told you it's talk talk. All right. Delete new. You know what they are? Uh, Constant cast, dynamic cast, reinterpret cast, and static cast. Constant cast removes constantness. 
So if you have constant character pointer A, and for some reason you want to write something in A, you can. Just constant cast it and remove the cast to whatever you want. So essentially, you can shoot yourself in a foot legally. OK? All right? That's that one. OK, dynamic cast is when you are doing cast between hierarchy of classes, like a, an employee and a person. Like a, a, an employee is a person. You can upcast and downcast between the two if the object exists. So if in the hierarchy of inheritance, you have a pointer of, an, a, pointer of a person that points to an employee, you can upcast that thing to an employee if you want to. And if you do a, a, a wrong upcast, it's going to throw an exception and won't allow you to do it. Reinterpret cast essentially means I know what I'm doing. I want to do anything to anything. That's what you do. <laughs> OK? And static cast is essentially the old cast that we used to do with C. So essentially, casting an integer to a long, casting a float to an integer, casting a, a I don't know, an integer pointer to a, so pointer to pointer, things like that that you want to. Uh, that's it. Let me see if there is anything else. I literally see that you guys are dozing off, but what can I do? Uh, oh, important. Postfix operators are not L value. Postfix operators are not L value, prefix R, which means this will cause an error. This will not. So this returns a reference of I after it's done. This is an R value, and it doesn't return the reference, so it's going to cause an error for you. Why? Because the sky is high. <laughs> uh, I can tell you, when you overload, but I'll tell you why. When you overload plus plus, how you have to do it? To actually make it look like it happens after. When you overload, you've done it in OP244, right? When you want to do plus plus, plus plus happens after the fact, right? After the statement. How do we overload so it actually happens after? We create a temporary object. We keep the current state of the object. Then we do all the implements. We return that old temporary one, correct? Because it's an old temporary one, it's a temporary one. It's an R value. You cannot add anything to it. Simple and straightforward, OK? Remember that, OK? Let me see if there's anything else that's missing. It was negation. Uh, we're going to talk about we was operators at the end of the semester, I think. I think it's somewhere over there. Um, bitwise operators are a lot of a uh, lot of things that we a uh, lot of uh, uh, oh deck type. So <clears throat> when you don't know what an outcome of an operator is what an outcome of an expression is, and you want to have a variable to keep that value, that's going to be it. So if I don't know what i and j is going to create, I can say deck type i plus j and create a variable. So this becomes the type that this is going to return. All right. All right. Throw, we talked about it. it. It's not even worth mentioning because we're not talking catch and stuff, but just know it. Sorry, I'm just trying to see if I missed anything. Lazy evaluation. Are we OK with it? Did I talk about lazy evaluation here, or it was OP244? Did I talk about lazy evaluation? Anybody? No? And you didn't hear it from OP244 either? You did, right? You bad people. You don't just. All right. Lazy evaluation implies that C++ will forfeit the evaluation of an expression, if it gets to the result, it won't waste its time, waste its time to go through things if it knows what the result is. So if I have integer a, OK, equal to 5, OK? If I have a less than 3, 
and C out ABC. The C out ABC will never happen. Because it looks at A less than 3, it is not. This value is false. Because it's false, false and anything is finalized. Okay, electric circuit. That's a light bulb. This is a battery. This is an AND operation. If both switches are on, the light goes on. If the first one goes off, do I need to bother checking the second one? No. C++ won't. Simple. So essentially, the lazy evaluation with AND is when it's false. With OR, this is the one. Ooh, that's the light bulb, and there's a battery over here. So if this one, if one of them goes on, you don't need to check the other one. The circuit's closed, right? That's an OR operation. So with an OR, if you have true at the beginning, the rest will be ignored. This is done many times, especially when they are doing graphics program, because it's extremely fast. It's much faster than regular if statement. An if statement is a condition check and a go-to. Right? But with this one, it's not like that. It's just uh, uh, an evaluation. So I think I actually did it somewhere in here when I was doing, let me just, I think it was title or something. Let me just show it to you so you'll see exactly what I mean. Um, there you go, see? That's an if statement. That says, that means if len is greater than max title, set the len to max title len. If this thing goes false, the second will not get evaluated, therefore it's not going to get executed. Are we okay? All right? Okay. Lazy evaluation. Don't pack your, oh, it's one minute past? Okay, read this stuff, the rest of it yourself. Have a beautiful day. <laughs>